Let's talk about some of the biggest headline on the market about pre-construction in Toronto. You have probably heard some alarming stories regarding the one like the downtown condo skyscraper going into receivership and owing 1.6 billion of dollars. In addition, many more projects stalled as construction walls mounted. How this all comes down to this with so much confusion, worries and rumors, let's take a look at today's video. Hey, welcome back to AV Team Real Estate. I'm Antonio, the local real estate agent in the GTA. Again, if you enjoy the content that I put out every week, don't forget to hit the like button. And if you haven't already, consider subscribing to the channel. I greatly appreciate it. Let's start by talking about the problem that exists with developers in the current market. You could be somewhat correct if you believe that the one condo headline story is what's causing the present real estate market's high level of interest. But primarily, this is an ongoing problem for many GTA builders. For most people, they think that developers make a big profit and reflect on the high prices of pre-construction condos. But in reality, the builders really make a low profit margin. The source is coming from pre-condo. If you want to learn more about pre-construction, he is the one source that I strongly recommend. There is a blog post from him that I will link to in the description below if you are interested. In summary, the profit margin for developers is between 7 and 13 percent. That's right. The grand scheme is quite small for a project that is going to last for mostly more than four to seven years including delays inflation labor etc it is a huge risk that developers had to go through here is another article from rbc stating that canada residential construction price index has soared 51 percent since the start of the pandemic the cost of building a home in canada or any structure for that matter has never been higher this is a huge jump of 51 percent since 2020 and to take account of of shortage of workers particularly in the skilled trades and last but not least huge development charges have also spiked alongside higher material costs and increases in expected population growth all this is a huge factor in that the developers have to assume the risk that they started the project year before an event such as this happened yes the high interest in today's environment contributed to what happened to the one condo but mainly this is the result of the risk that most developers have to take because they have such a low profit margin. Anything that changes during the long years of production is kind of forced to increase the price for that reason. Revisiting this diagram, you can see that if government charges soft costs and construction go up significantly, the project could not only be breaking even, it could definitely lose money, which is the result of many project cancellations. This is the number one reason builders are by far the most important factor for you to consider when purchasing pre-construction. A reputable and expensive experienced developer could withstand the time and event with a sizable fund when a smaller developer, more often than not, will result in cancellation. Builders such as Tridel, the Mona Group, and Mankeys are among the top builders in Canada and they can afford to absorb some uncertainty in the market and make up for it in other projects, but that can be said for smaller developers. Let's break down exactly what happened to the one condo as the biggest headline in the current news. The developers of the one condo are Sam Misari and Jenny Coco as a partnership. Sam Misari came to Canada from Iran in 1976 and throughout this youth and early adulthood, Misrahi held a number of entrepreneurial positions, most recently establishing himself as a luxurious condominium developer. However, he is an ambitious entrepreneur. I did some research on him and in his portfolio, he was involved in a few boutique condos in the Yorkville area, a prestigious and expensive neighborhood, and therefore he knew a bit of the luxurious market in Toronto. However, a few projects do not make him a well-established and reputable developer. I would say that there will be a danger ahead, especially with such an ambitious project that would become the tallest building in the most important location of Toronto. It all started in 2014 when he bought the land at Young and Bloor for 300 million. This is not to be confused with One Bloor East, which is developed by another developer in the Great Gulf. When Sam Mirzrahi first obtained the land, he quickly 
quickly demolished the existing men's clothing building in 2015 that was there for 114 years before the city could impose a heritage status on the building at the time. The site was left there for two and a half years and on October 16th of 2017 when they officially launched the project and had a huge broker event that was the talk of the town. Of course, there were a number of reasons to be excited about the project. In the most important intersection of Toronto at Young and Bloor, it will become the tallest building in Toronto with 85 stories and the heaviest luxury price tag. This is definitely a big iconic skyscraper in Toronto with an ambitious goal. The first red flag is that Sam Mizrahi and Jenny Coco couldn't get funding from the five major banks due to the high risk involved in such an ambitious project. And instead, it was funded by a Chinese lender that was first unnamed. And in this article from Globe and Mail, it was revealed that this Chinese company called China East Resources Import and Export Co. was suing Sam Mizrahi and Jenny Coco for failing to provide payment. The debt owed today is 1.6 million and it is officially appointed to a third party as receivership to take over to the construction delays and cost overruns. The one condo is supposed to be finished by December of 2022 at a cost of 1.4 billion. The second red flag was that although the building was proposed to be 85 stories tall, there were only 416 units in total. Don't get me wrong, it was a successful launch in 2017 and it quickly sold 346 units out of the 416 units, which means there are still 70 units remaining on the higher floors. In perspective, according to condonow.com, the unit size ranges from 1,495 to 6,137 square feet and the price per square foot is averaging at the moment is 2,474. Even the smallest unit of 1,500 square feet would cost about 3.7 million. However, even if they sell all the remaining 70 units at a higher price of let's say 3,000 per square foot, it is still far from breaking even on a debt of more than 1.6 billion at the moment. This is the reason why they appointed them and placed them on the receivership so that the lender could find out the details of how they could resolve the dilemma. In addition, Apple, the major anchor of the building's ground floor retail area, was supposed to be the largest tenant to open the building's flagship store on the main floor. However, it was later reported that Apple had already chosen to terminate the lease due to the ongoing delay and was also suing the developer. And above all, the partnership between Sam Misrahi and Jenny Coco, who each own 50% of the condo project, is also involved in a lawsuit on its own. It is an ongoing complexity within. Having said all this, the one is currently placed in receivership. What does that exactly mean? Well, it means the lender no longer trusts the developer and it will be appointed to a creditor to monitor and manage the remainder of the project. However, Sam Israhi will remain as the developer and general contractor to complete the development and also continues to maintain his equity position in the project with the arrangement of the Korean bank, Hana Bank, which agreed to provide another $315 million to fund the project. As a result, the project is still expected to be completed by March of 2025. If you pass by One Floor West, you will probably see the site with concrete wall that have so far only poured up to the 40th floor. With the receiver stepping in to complete the project, there are a few outcomes that I would like to discuss. If you were one of the buyers or curious about what would happen if you had already purchased one of the 346 units, what would this all mean to you? Well, in short, if the crow proceeds of the 346 units that are currently estimated at 675 million and the sale of all the 70 remaining units cover all the debt, of course that would be the best outcome. Then what would happen if the project managed to sell all the remainder units but still did not have enough to cover the debt? Here enters the alternative solution in which the receiver could end up cancelling all the purchase agreement and reselling all the units at market price or selling them to another developer to take over. Not only that, it will be a hard pill to swallow for buyers who bought it in 2017, but it will also be difficult to resell it at a much higher price for a developer with so much negative news on this project and a high interest environment. Or the most likely outcome is that the receiver will propose the new purchase price to the existing buyers, whether it will be 100,000, 200,000, 400,000 or more, depending on what the budget is, the purchasers will then have the option to accept the new proposed price or simply walk out and cancel the purchase agreement. There will be buyers who could end up deciding to keep their unit
component if they think that the remaining unit will drive up the prices and therefore their unit could benefit from that in the future. On the other hand, some buyers will cancel the purchase agreement and then the developer could resell the unit at a market price. This is by far the most ideal outcome for a developer since they do not need to restart sales from scratch and they will have enough unsold unit to make up for the debt that they own. If you were the buyer, you wouldn't need to worry about the deposit since Aviva Insurance will cover the remaining amount and you will be insured for the first 20,000 under tariff. It's simply a matter of time and opportunity cost, so there's really no need to worry about it. However, if you wish to cancel the agreement immediately, unfortunately, you are out of luck. You have to wait for the instruction from the receiver or else if the project is not completed by January of 2028, you don't have the choice to terminate it. This is the termination date that was set in the original purchase agreement. News like this is devastating. Stating. And if the high interest persists, it is difficult to tell how many more projects will be outrun by the budget and construction loans would be much harder to secure. As seen in many headlines, more projects are running into budget problems as well. And unpaid contractors and unsatisfied buyers are demanding answers from Toronto developers that are years behind on delivering multiple condominium projects. As this story unfolds, I hope you find valuable information about the detail of this project and the sentiments and high interest environment impacting the pre-construction market as a whole. Of course, it took me some time to go through the information to put out all this together. So if you like the content, don't forget to like and subscribe to the channel. I will always appreciate it. I hope you have a wonderful day and I'll see you in the next video. Bye.